Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. My name is Gus Docker and I'm here with Johannes Aqua. Johannes is a researcher at Founders Pledge where he leads the Climate Change Fund. Johannes, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Gus. Great to be here. I'm a big fan of the Future of Life Institute and yeah, happy to talk all things climate today. Perhaps we could start with your role at Founders Pledge. What is it that you do there? How do you, how do you see your role? Yeah, so I think the way I usually describe it is like um, my goal and, and the goal of my, my team is kind of to like find um, and fund kind of the highest impact opportunities in climate. And those are like philanthropic opportunities, right? So like things where we can, where a million dollars or something in that order of magnitude can kind of make a difference by supporting initiatives that are like extremely promising. And yeah, as you mentioned, kind of in the beginning, right? So there's kind of the the climate fund, which kind of puts this um, to life, the Founders Pledge Climate Fund, but also we're advising kind of high net worth individuals kind of uh, beyond that and kind of trying to, yeah, trying to identify using research and using prioritization research kind of to identify where where are the biggest uh, blind spots, what are the blind spot generating mechanisms, if you will, and kind of what, what does that mean for what you should fund on the margin as the as the next philanthropist. Yeah, and I, I think that word is the key. So thinking on the margin here, I see your job, or I think that that your job is about thinking about the marginal dollar. Where is that dollar best spent? Would that be the correct frame? Yes, uh, the next dollar or the next million dollar. And I think that's like a really, really um, crucial frame because I think a lot of the things that I, I am going to be saying is going to be like controversial and might be wrong if like if one would interpret them as in like, this is all we should be doing. And this, I'm not really talking about this is all what we should, we should I'm talking about like at the margin, this is what we should be doing relatively, relatively more off. Yeah. We're going to get into a broad overview of the whole climate change issue. We're going to look at all the potential technologies or government options that might help us alleviate this problem. But I think we should start with your personal journey as an environmentalist. So how did you end up in this role? Where did you start? When did you first become interested in the climate? So, I mean, I grew up in the 90s in Germany, so it was very easy to kind of become an environmentalist, I think. So kind of, in my, I remember like some of my first childhood memories kind of being very interested in, in saving the tiger. So it's like inventing a board game, save the Siberian tiger, kind of like, and like, yeah, there was a an animal documentary on like three times a week and like the last five or 10 minutes of the documentary would always be like, okay, and now humans are, are destroying this beautiful nature, right? So that, that was kind of, um, I think, <laughs> very big part um, of kind of, yeah, of this, of this, I think, initial, initial education or becoming an environmentalist. And I guess I got more serious about this kind of, yeah, in my, in my teenage years when I was like an environmental activist for the German chapter of um, Friends of the Earth and kind of like protesting President Bush to sign the Kyoto Protocol when he was visiting th this kind of stuff. So that's kind of where it started. And then I kind of, when it came to, to university, I think the idea for me was, okay, let's kind of study social sciences with a focus on like understanding what's kind of, what kind of makes um, climate policies uh, successful. So that's kind of what I spent kind of my, my studies on. And then I was working afterwards uh, for, for a think tank in Germany for five years, kind of working on carbon pricing. And that's kind of ultimately after this kind of joint, joint founders pledge kind of went into uh, philanthropy. So that's kind of um, the story. Yeah. And, and what's something you've changed your mind about? Where, where have you gotten new ideas or learned new facts that kind of changed your priorities? I mean, lots, lots and lots over the years, right? So that was kind of like a very short introduction to like a 20 year journey. I think the first big change was probably in, in college, kind of. So at that point, I was kind of, yeah, very strongly kind of, yeah, as I said, like influenced by the environmental movement, kind of was kind of ca card carrying environmentalist, if you will. And essentially at that point, kind of, yeah, as I said, I was kind of studying social science or kind of focusing on, on political culture and understanding in a way that like the things that I believed or the kind of people like me would believe about how to solve the climate change, right? So like heavily focused on renewables, heavily focused on energy efficiency, heavily focused on lifestyle change, being anti-nuclear, being somewhat skeptical of technological innovation, right? That essentially all of those beliefs kind of fit together kind of in a very systematic fashion, right? And what unites them is not that they're kind of an adequate response to the climate challenge. What unites them is that they're kind of part of a 
specific ideology in this kind this case kind of like a kind of egalitarian green um, ideology which kind of is, is framing a large part of the climate conversation so i think that was kind of the first really important realization that like all of all of the responses to the climate and to other problems are kind of heavily ideological shaped right and like if you have a situation like uh, we have in climate, which is kind of dominated by one kind of ideology, this will kind of shape the shape the results. So, so I think that was kind of one. I think another one a bit later, when I was studying in the in the United States, this was like 2012, 2011, 2012. This was the time where essentially in the U.S., kind of the big push, the big push um, under Obama to kind of push for climate policy. Waxman Markey was the name, so like kind of a cap and trade bill in the United States kind of had just failed, right? And this was like a once in a generation moment with regards to uh, climate policy in the US, right? So like the Democrats had like won the presidency, had like a huge majority uh, in the House and the um, in the Senate as well, right? So like it was kind of a situation of reckoning, like what are we going to do now? Because like even, even under such favorable conditions that we kind of can expect every like 15 or 20 years, like we're not able to pass climate policy in the US. So I think in that time, I've kind of discovered kind of, I think what, what I would describe as kind of like the innovation hawk argument uh, in climate, right? So like people that are like very heavily focused um, on innovation, which I think at that time was kind of not, not that big a part of the, of the climate um, coalitions. I think that's kind of another thing that changed around that time. Uh, and I don't think I go all the way, but it's kind of interesting. So, because in a way, what they did or what they were emphasizing kind of became a big part of climate policy that later passed. So like that has just passed with, with President Biden as kind of essentially putting this, lots of those ideas into practice. But so that is another one. And then I think another kind of big one, of course, um, for me growing up as a German environmentalist, I was heavily anti-nuclear. And, and being in the US also, it's the first time kind of exposed to, to pro-nuclear environmentalists. and. For a time, was kind of lukewarm about nuclear, and at some point, kind of realized, okay, uh, even though it's very uncomfortable in the German context, because otherwise reasonable people become like very unreasonable and very emotionally aggressive, like when you're talking about nuclear and when you're being pro-nuclear. But that was kind of an important uh, shift of mind as well. I think those are kind of three, and then two more recent ones. Um, I would say uh, 2015. Um, essentially the success of the Paris Agreement. So up until 2015, I think international climate policy by and large had always failed. Um, and this was kind of like the expectations were very low. And then um, the fact that the Paris Agreement kind of succeeded, even though it's kind of a non-binding agreement, but it kind of has completely changed the conversations that we're having in different countries. So it kind of it serves as this kind of um, North Star that kind of lots of national conversations are kind of focused on. So I think that's kind of was another surprise in a way. In what sense did the Paris Agreement succeed? What are, what have been the results of it? I mean, the Paris Agreement has succeeded. I mean, not only the Paris Agreement, but like around that time. So like that was in late 2015 and then like 2016, 2017, the nature of the climate conversation has completely changed, right? Like around that time in, in Western countries anyway, in the sense that like before it was kind of a relatively niche issue and it kind of became like a broad societal consensus that like meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement matters. I mean, it's maybe not a political consensus across the political aisle in all countries, but at least kind of for the left, the center left kind of in all countries. So, so I think that kind of um, really changed and kind of the idea of, of net zero and that climate was kind of a top issue. Yeah. So I think that's kind of, I think what the Paris Agreement achieved, right? And like, this is kind of very significant, like compared, right? It's like, it's a non-binding treaty ultimately. So there, there is a version, I think you could have had a cynical take on this agreement kind of before, like it's not, and I, and I certainly had this to a degree, like it's not gonna do much because it's like a non-binding, very weak agreement. And on some level that's true. Um, so that's not what it's doing. What it's doing is kind of like transforming, transforming the conversation. And you, you mentioned a, a last thing that you changed your mind on? I think a last thing uh, that I would mention is kind of that, I think that's kind of maybe like 2020 or so, essentially that um, the situation around climate has improved very, very significantly, which is kind of funny to say this because I think most people have the, have the opposite perception, but like, 
in general that like so like in 2015 2016 people were saying things like there's a five percent probability of some of more of six degrees or more warming and i think right now if you would make this forecast the the forecast right now would be something like it's maybe like half a percent that we get to, to six degrees at all and not more than six degrees so like an order of magnitude change and so essentially that the forecast before were probably a bit pessimistic but also that the situation kind of has has changed very significantly mostly through the success of renewables the success of kind of um, electric cars that essentially the the very high risk climate futures are essentially almost ruled out at this point and that's a very significant um, change I'm wondering when you're working with climate change, this is such a complex issue. It's it's a it involves a lot of disciplines, uh, not just climate science itself, but economics and law and uh, physics and engineering and all of these disciplines. How is how do you form an all things considered view of the situation in light of all of these disciplines? I mean, you can't go get a, a PhD in all of them, I'm guessing. And so how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you approach this? I mean, in theory you could, but by the time you have those PhDs, the, the problem is solved. Um, yeah. So I think the answer here, I mean, has to be to kind of, essentially you're always in the state of like kind of being um, a reviewer and kind of like a reviewer of different pieces of evidence. So that's like one piece of the answer. Another piece of the answer is kind of, obviously you do this in a team, right? So like um, essentially right now, um, in my team, but like we have a specialist kind of for the techno economics, we have a specialist for carbon lock and emerging economies, we have a specialist uh, for for philanthropy and how other philanthropists behave. So that's kind of another piece of the answer. But to, I think to answer it more substantively, I think there's kind of like three kinds of expertise that are like most significant when it comes to the question of like that I'm trying to answer, which is like what should we be doing philanthropically, right? So which is kind of um, like only one way to, to answer the question but there I think it's kind of like one is kind of really the social science question of like political feasibility like which kind of like carbon taxes can we get where which kind of policies can we achieve in a given country so that's kind of like what does the option space um, actually look like so that's kind of I think the one key expertise the other one is kind of like what do different policies or different kind of things in the world what do they achieve right so like that's i guess policy analysis and econometrics and stuff like that and then there's kind of because climate change is really a decadal challenge and a global challenge and like it's also a challenge about global technological transformation so then there's kind of this question of like what do changes in, in countries kind of what are the long-term consequences of that and kind of changing the, the technology stack if you will globally so it's a techno-economic question and i think those three expertises are kind of the most um most relevant ones um from a from a solution-oriented perspective and then of course if you're a philanthropist like myself then also like what are other philanthropists doing right because like doing the best thing on the margin is almost always about kind of finding blind spots and filling the blind spots. Okay, so let's get to this broad overview that I would like of, of climate change. On the broadest possible scale, what is it that's driving climate change? Is it mostly emissions? And if so, where are these emissions coming from? So it's like mostly mostly emissions, right? And so like all of the, I mean, all of climate change is, is, is about emissions. And so if you kind of, I mean, there's a diff different ways to slice it, but I guess let's first kind of slice it by sector. So if you kind of look at it by sector, then there's like 75% of emissions are related to kind of um, energy. And energy here, like one very important thing about climate, electricity is only a small part of energy. Electricity is about a third of energy. So like when I say 75%, that's not only electricity, right? That's also kind of transport fuels, that's um, heating fuels, and that's also stuff like industrial heat essentially the burning of fossil fuels uh, to produce energy. So that's about 75% of emissions. Then there's about 5% of emissions of kind of um, emissions from industrial processes. So stuff like producing uh, cement or chemicals where you kind of have emissions that are not related to fossil fuels that are called process emissions, right? And that doesn't mean that industry is only 5%. This is about the kind of the, the non-energy share of industry. So that together gets you to like about 80%. And then there's about 15 or like 18% that's kind of related to, to agricultural emissions uh, broadly. 
And then the last 5% or so is kind of um, a combination of, on the one hand, stuff like deforestation, and on the other hand, uh, stuff like waste. So yeah, I think 80% 80, 80 of the challenge is kind of energy, energy and industry. There's two important uh, qualifications to this. This is kind of where the emissions are coming from right now, right? And like, that doesn't mean that this is exactly proportional to what the solution looks like. So like, it can definitely be the case that kind of um, land use change and kind of like restoring wilderness, et cetera, is like a bigger part of the of the solution pies. I think that's kind of one qualification. And another qualification is that these percentages are kind of heavily dependent on what um, warming metric you use. So the, the numbers that I uh, cited right now are kind of for what's called global warming potential 100. So like if we're kind of assuming over the course um, of 100 years, if you kind of take a shorter view, if you would say something like global warming potential for the next 20 years, then something like agriculture would have like a larger share because methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas in the short term, has kind of a relatively larger share in agriculture than in other sectors. So that's another important qualification here. Yeah. And in, in, in global terms, are emissions still increasing? Yes. And how, 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 for how long do we expect them to increase? Well, I mean, people have been talking about the end to emission increase for, for, for a long time, and then there's always something um, something else coming up. So I think we will probably see the end to increasing emissions this decade. Um, so, I mean, it's mostly dependent on what China and India are doing at this point, and they're both kind of, yeah, have the goal to kind of peak their emissions rather soon. So it, it could happen, um, could happen this decade. Yeah, you mentioned China and India, we should talk about uh, geographically where emissions are coming from, where where have they come from in the past? And where are they likely to come from in the future? Well, so I think in the past, right, um, if you kind of take the long view, then and that's like, um, most of the emissions are certainly like have been caused by, by Western countries. I think that's, that's kind of clear. And like, we do have uh, being in Western countries, like a large historical um, responsibility. But if we kind of look at the situation right now, so like the US right now, something like 15% of emissions, the EU is something around like 10%. And like Asia is kind of something like close to two thirds of emissions and then kind of the, the rest. And if we kind of think this picture going forward, right? So like the share of the EU and the share of the US is kind of going to further degree, decrease. I mean, probably to something like for the US to something like 5% for like um, the EU, maybe something like 3%. And then, uh, yeah, China is going to be something like 25%, I think, over, over the course of the century. Then other, other emerging Asia, kind of India, and then Southeast Asia. And then kind of at some point later in the century, Africa, um, hopefully, will, hopefully will, will grow strongly. And like, I mean, yeah, let's hope it's going to be low carbon. But like, I guess there's, there's kind of, that's kind of also part of the, um, the long game. So like the emissions are very clearly the focus of emissions is, is very much changing, right? That's kind of what I sometimes call like the central conundrum of climate policy, which is like the people that are responsible for a lot of the historical emissions kind of have very little direct leverage on kind of how bad the, the problem is going to become because kind of essentially in the EU, like there's not a lot of emissions you can reduce, like, I mean, anymore, right? Like, I mean, already kind of reaching the goal of getting to carbon neutrality by 2050 is like very ambitious, but at that point, like there's, there's no leverage left. Because you project that EU is only going to be 3% of emissions. And so reducing emissions by 3% would be great, but it's not going to tackle the problem in a big way. Essentially, most of the leverage that the EU has on emissions does not come from the own territorial emissions, right? So if we kind of look at the most significant things that EU countries have done, it's like things like Denmark making wind energy cheap, Germany kind of making solar cheap. These, these kind of things have like done way, way more to like transform the energy future than like emission changes within Europe. European countries have subsidized technologies that can then be exported to other countries where they can decrease emissions much more than they could in those European countries themselves. From what you're saying, the, the biggest problem or the biggest driver of emissions is energy production. I wonder if, the, if that category is too broad. I mean, a lot of things must, must be covered by energy production. Is it what, what does that category cover? 
Yeah, so like I think, yeah, I mean, it covers kind of um, electricity, it covers heating, it covers transport, and it also covers, I mean, that's also heating, but it's kind of very different than what we mean when we say so heating, like stuff like industrial heat, right? Which is like steel and stuff like that. And like on some level, it's kind of too broad a term. I still find it useful to think about as kind of one piece, because especially if we're thinking about kind of the solution trajectory, right? So like what, like, I guess the master plan, plan and so far as there is a master plan to kind of uh, solve climate, right? It's essentially um, electrify everything uh, or like, I mean, electrify all energy consumption, right? So in that sense, like historically those sectors have been very different, but like, or kind of also very different in terms of the fuels, but like you want to get in a situation where like the central problem is, is one of kind of on the one hand getting electricity or energy production kind of low or zero carbon. And on the other hand, kind of either directly, right, with electric cars or indirectly through stuff like hydrogen, um, electrifying kind of a lot of um, other stuff. So in that sense, it's it's a cross simplification to speak of like energy as, as one sector, but it's also, I think if we're kind of at the, at the, at the broad level, it's, it's a useful one in terms of um, yeah, in terms of the solution landscape. Yeah, so 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 the category is, is kind of unified by the same solution. The same solution would solve all of the 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 things that belong to that category. So electrification would be a solution for many of of, of the things that belong to that category. Or is that too strong? I mean, it's just a little bit too strong, but I think it's kind of right in the yeah, basically right. I would say right. So so. How far electrification goes kind of depends on like like things are differentially easy to electrify. So like things that are hard to electrify is stuff that kind of requires, I mean, either a long duration of storage or like lots of kind of concentrated energy or so like stuff like heavy duty transport, right? Like electrifying trucks is much harder than electrifying uh, passenger cars and like electrifying lar or like decarbonizing large ships is kind of much harder and airplanes much harder than cars. So, and for some of those, um, you might either use kind of indirect electrification, right? So kind of like hydrogen or like using power to create hydrogen, but it might also go um, another way. You can also kind of create uh, the hydrogen kind of uh, with natural gas and carbon capture and storage. So, yeah, so, so there, 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 that's kind of where there is um, more, more nuance there where, where we can kind of dive, dive deeper. Why is it more difficult to electrify an airplane than a car? Is it is it because the airplane will have a, will have a need for higher peak energy output or something like that? Well, it's essentially. I mean, batteries are very heavy, and so like an airplane becomes much more efficient because once you burn the fuel, it's kind of not it has no weight anymore, um, and it's also so like that's kind of one part, and like the other part is kind of like energy energy density, right? So like in principle, like flying an air like flying kind of requires a lot of like it's kind of much harder than kind of uh, moving moving a car around and so you kind of need need higher energy density okay so what i want to do is is to walk through all of the potential technological options we have start with that i'm going to start with talking about uh, oil and coal which is kind of a, a funny place to start maybe because in the in some sense oil and coal is is the whole reason for the problem but i think it's interesting to discuss oil and coal just because if we know something about why they are hard to replace, we might know something about uh, how to how to best go about the climate change problem. So, yeah, I've I've written down that that oil and coal is cheap and it works in a, in existing systems. Uh, do you see other advantages beyond those I just mentioned? Yeah, I think those are kind of the the two really big ones, right? And like work in existing systems. I think another way to put this is like we've essentially built an entire world economy around them. <laughs> so they fit with existing systems because we built an entire economy around them and not only an economy, right? Like the United States is kind of having aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf because kind of protecting oil reserves is kind of part of the, well, it's like part of the, the overall kind of strategy, right? So it's like, yeah, um, essentially we've been spending more than a century optimizing our energy and world economy for relying on oil coal, natural gas. I think another kind of advantage that they do have, I mean, at least if we compare them to renewables, um, to most renewables is that they do have um, higher energy densities. So um, yeah, and then of course, um, I mean, in the case of oil, right, like oil is easy to transport, uh, coal is also relatively easy to transport uh, with gas, it's, it's a bit harder. 
yeah, so I think this is kind of what, like broadly speaking, that's that seems like uh, the right characterization. And of course, the enormous disadvantage here is that there's very high emissions associated with uh, oil and coal. And I think additionally, there are there are quite large problems with air pollution, which provides us with an additional reason to replace oil and coal. Maybe you could talk about air pollution from from oil and coal. How big of a problem is that? So air pollution at large kills about 7 million people every year. Uh, so it's like one of the leading causes of death. And not all of that is related to fossil fuels, right? So like you also have the situation that some of that is actually related to <laughs> renewables. So like to, um, especially in Africa, people burning wood for heating at home and for, for cooking. So that that's actually a situation where like using a fossil fuel, in this case, natural gas would actually be much better because it would, um, but essentially, so um, in particular, coal and uh, oil kind of, yeah, yeah, kill, kill a lot of people. So gas is a lot cleaner. So gas is about 15 times cleaner than coal in terms of um, air pollution, uh, but it's a very significant cause of death. And I think it's also really underappreciated. So like people usually talk about air pollution as kind of like a co-benefit of climate change. And like climate change has to get really bad to kill like 5 million people every year. Like, right. So like, it's kind of quite possible that resolving climate change and like the most significant effect of that is kind of a reduction in kind of um, air pollution uh, casualties, right? Obviously, like this is not the highest risk case, right? Like there are cases with, there's no case with air pollution, like killing 100 million people, right? And there's kind of cases, there's the risk cases around climate that kind of motivate caring about climate that are that are more extreme than killing 5 million, million people. But like, we, we, yeah, it's just, just I guess it's, kind of, it's, not, it's not a co-benefit, it's kind of a problem on, the, on a similar order of magnitude. Yeah, it makes sense. Air pollution is a huge deal. Why is it that oil and gas is hard to replace? And here we might talk about uh, carbon lock-in also, which is a term that, that, that's used. The primary reason and it's like energy transitions are, well, energy transitions are hard for a couple of reasons, right? But like, okay, let's, let's kind of start with the, with the lock-in reason to begin with. A lot of the assets, right, like pipelines uh, or coal power plants, or highways, et cetera, right? Like those are very long lived assets, right? They have natural lifetimes that are like 40 or 60 years, the capital intensive assets. So like, even if like you're kind of in a situation where like every new build is kind of the low carbon alternative, it will take you like 40 years to kind of turn around like an entire system, right? And that's kind of um, an optimistic case. So like, it's like, there's a lot of kind of lock-in and then there's, so like, this is kind of, at the pure kind of technical or infrastructural level, right? And then you also have stuff like, uh, like pipelines and infrastructure, which are which are even even longer longer lived than than single assets. And then of course you have like a huge kind of political economy, like political special interest kind of groups, and kind of the entire kind of fate of countries essentially built around that, right? I guess like when people say like. Putin used to behave like a the CEO of like a gas company, right? Like, I mean kind of changed a little bit the way he's behaving, but like, right, like it's kind of like, uh, like their entire countries or entire kind of regions of the world that are like heavily dependent on, on the fossil fuel um, economy. So I think that's kind of another um, really big reason. Um, and another reason of like, obviously is also like energy transitions in general move towards denser forms of energy, right? So like what we're trying to do right now, uh, where we're essentially saying, okay, we want to move from a fossil fuel uh, dominated energy economy to one that's kind of dominated by renewables, it's kind of not a natural direction for an energy transition uh, to go. So like the, the mo more natural direction of energy transitions thus far has been like from less energy dense fuels, stuff like from biomass to fossil fuels, right? And like going from fossil fuels to mostly, uh, mostly renewable powered uh, systems, actually it's not a natural um, move of the energy system. It probably wouldn't happen like and, and then there are many other situations where it kind of wouldn't wouldn't happen. Yeah, maybe here is a, is a a natural point to talk about energy density. Why is energy density important? So energy density, right? So like essentially how much land or how many resources do you need to kind of produce a given amount of energy? So the reason that's important, I think is kind of like twofold. I mean, from an environmental perspective, energy density is essentially a proxy for like how much 
uh, impact do we have on the environment, right? So if you're using less land, if you're using less materials, then you're kind of like, in principle, like lower energy density means like lower environmental impact. So that's kind of one, uh, one part of it. The other part, which is more about like what's useful for, for human civilization, right? So like having denser forms of energy, like if you're talking about electricity, it means like you need less transmission, for example, right? So like that's kind of another use. And you also kind of, if you want to power like industri an industrial center or like an urbanizing society, like having lots of energy and having relatively dense forms of energy is useful. One shouldn't overdo this, right? It's like, I'm not saying like on the limit kind of, we would have like one big fusion plant and we all kind of just get from, the... so that's clearly not the case. I think we've seen this with nuclear fission that like having very large kind of energy sources also has its downside because demand isn't always there. So like not take it to the extreme limit, but like a kind of on some level, like energy density in principle is kind of a useful, a useful metric. But when you, when you talk about energy density, it's, you're talking about also the resources necessary to produce that energy, not only the energy density, say, for example, of a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cube of coal or oil or uh, fuel for, for a nuclear reactor. It's a broader term than that. That's energy density, where we have historically been moving towards forms of energy that are that are more dense, and now we're trying to move towards forms of energy that are that are less dense. I think before we get to renewables, we should we should talk about natural gas that that you mentioned a couple of times. And um, what are the advantages here and and uh, disadvantages? I'm guessing it's it's uh, better than oil and coal. Just to add on the energy density, like because we've talked about why it's important, but we didn't talk about what does it actually look like. So like. Uh, if you kind of if, if you look at the metric side, so nuclear nuclear power would be something like seven terawatt hours per square kilometers. Uh, natural gas, which we're going to talk about next, is like about half that, and like solar is kind of about a hundred or so, roughly, what nuclear is, right? So that's kind of why it matters. Like the differences are are quite stark, both from from renewables to fossil fuels and from fossil fuels to to nuclear. Like natural gas, if we talk about natural gas. So, I mean, it's about half as polluting um, as coal uh, in terms of CO2, and it's much, much less polluting, about 15 times less polluting when we talk about air pollution. And essentially, if we look at the decarbonization successes of the last 20 years, like many of them have been coal to gas transitions. So like essentially the fact that the US was kind of able to reduce emissions, even though until like 2021 didn't really have much in terms of climate policy, it's like mostly the story of the fracking revolution in the United States and kind of the, the replacement of coal by natural gas, uh, a little bit similar in the UK. In the UK, there's kind of natural gas is also like more of a renewable expansion um, than that. So, so like, that's kind of another, so like, that's kind of, it has been a big story. It's like an easy win, right? It's not a transformational win because you don't get to zero emissions, but it's kind of the easy win. So if you're imposing a moderate carbon price in a place with a lot of coal, that will usually mean you're going to substitute it with natural gas. In which cases does it make sense to switch to natural gas? I mean, that's kind of like, right, that, that's kind of, I think, something where the climate community has like two different perspectives, right? I think there are people that are more incrementalist that would say like, yeah, it's good if you're switching from coal to natural gas. There's also people that would say, okay, if you're switching from coal to natural gas, you're locking in another fossil fuel source, right? And it's kind of like better to maybe have coal run a bit longer and then fully replace it with a zero carbon source. So I think that's kind of the debate. And I think different people have like different opinions. And I think also the, the right answer might be different in different places. The best case scenario would be one for a like natural gas replaced with coal. And then natural gas is kind of replaced with natural gas and gas and carbon, carbon capture. So where you're kind of capping the emissions or where, you, where you're using kind of part of the natural gas infrastructure with like zero carbon uh, fuels, right? So like with um, natural gas kind of that's produced um, for electrolysis and kind of like additional, like adding CO2 there or yeah, so, so synthetic um, uh, natural gas essentially. So that last point, is there a way to produce nat natural gas that's more environmentally friendly? So, I mean, natural gas is just CH4. So in principle, you can, um, you can get it from H2, like from hydrogen, uh, like which you can generate in a low carbon way. And if you would kind of, then take CO2 out of the air. So you can essentially produce like carbon neutral natural gas, right? Like that's, uh, yeah. Or you could use hydrogen. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so essentially there, there's ideas about using 
some of the kind of natural gas infrastructure for like zero carbon gases. Yeah, so that's, I think, something like one way where carbon lock-in can be made a little bit less severe, right? Where you're like locking in like a gas infrastructure, for example, but that gas could at some point be, be carbon neutral. Yeah, if we build a new natural gas plant now, how much carbon are we locking in? For how many years would this uh, natural gas plant have to run in order to be profitable or to make sense to build? If you're building new natural gas plants right now, I think the expectation, like most, like if you're in a Western country, I don't think the investor would have the expectation that they're going to run this for 40 years because like running this for 40 years would mean you're now 2023. So like 13 years after uh, kind of most Western countries have committed to like reaching uh, net zero. That being said, right, like even countries like Germany <laughs> um, that are kind of priding themselves to be climate leaders are, are building new natural gas uh, capacity right now in an, in an energy crisis uh, situation, right? So we're essentially, I guess the way this becomes profitable is because we really do value energy security. So like um, as countries, we're, we're willing to kind of finance things that don't make sense in a, in a long run perspective, if you will. Maybe we could say a bit more about energy density and, and why it's important. Is it important because some forms of energy take up too much space and then crowd out other other things we would like to do with that space, like having natural habitats or yeah, using the land for agriculture? Or what, what's the problem with energy sources with low energy density? So like crowding out of um, like other land uses is definitely um, a factor, right? So especially for, for biofuels, I think it's a, it's a factor because like biofuels take up a lot of land and like kind of agricultural land that, that can compete with like food security concerns. Yeah, so I think that is kind of uh, one concern. So like land use, right? So like if I've looked at a paper where essentially that's kind of modeling a transition towards a lower carbon future and what they're essentially like and like a renewable heavy future what they're essentially modeling is like okay by 2050 there is a six-fold increase in the land require required for energy production compared to today and like to be fair like it's not that it's six times less efficient because also like electricity production is like assumed to triple over the time frame right so that's kind of a halving of like efficiency in terms of like energy density, but it's like a still a significant change. I think to me, the more, the more fundamental challenge is really one of like, if you're having lots of decentralized energy sources, like kind of the requirements in terms of transmission and like infrastructure build out are kind of like much, much larger, right? So essentially when we're saying it is cheap and it is easy to build renewables, what we're talking about is kind of on the plant level where this is true. But when we're talking about the energy system level and say like we want to build an energy system that is primarily based on low energy density sources, like I'm not saying this cannot work, but like this is like a risky proposition, mostly for the for transmission and, and storage um, requirements that are kind of yeah, related, related to low energy density uh, and intermittency. Okay, so that's oil, coal, and natural gas. Um, what about if we if we get into the renewables, so solar and wind? What are some advantages of, of solar and wind? At this point, solar and wind are pretty cheap. So at this point, I think in many in many places in the world, it will be the case that like adding solar capacity to the grid is like one of the cheapest things you can do. It's very important to realize that like this is not a fact. Uh, of like nature or like technology itself that's a, that's a result of like very conscious social choices right i mean it's essentially countries like germany and jurisdictions like california and then then later kind of china uh essentially saying okay we really want to have cheap renewables and we're really like heavily investing that so in that sense kind of the fact that we have cheap renewables right now is much more a function of their popularity with constituencies than it is kind of of like the principle underlying technology right so like if, if like nuclear would be as popular as like renewables are, we, we probably also could have like cheap nuclear now. That's, that's kind of what I'm saying. Um, or a geothermal for that matter. So I think that's kind of an important aspect here. So yeah, they're, they can be quite cheap. And also there, there are use cases where, where decentralized and kind of smaller production is kind of good, right? So, I mean, you can kind of um, use, deploy them um, where they are needed, right? You, like if you're, um, if you're a small town, you're not going to build your own kind of big um, power plant, but you can build your put your solars on the rooftop, etc. So I think that's kind of the main advantage. Obviously, it produces no carbon, uh, no air pollution. Um, yeah. 
and can be can be built quickly. Yeah. So you mentioned that that solar and wind have gotten cheaper because of basically policies by European countries and by California and so on. When when solar has reached the price point that it has that it that it's at now, does it require kind of continual uh, subsidies to to stay at that price point, or have we developed solar to a point now that it's it's price competitive even on an open market, let's say? So in energy, you generally don't have open markets. I think that's an important thing to 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 realize. So solar is competitive in many cases, right? But like, it's not like with oil, where like you have a global price of oil, right? It's like, essentially for solar, like how, how cost effective a solar compared to alternatives depends on like how good is the solar resource. Depends also on like how much solar is already on the grid, because like you can be in a situation where like installing the additional solar capacity is very cheap, but it's not going to produce a lot of additional value because essentially like the sun is shining at the time where you're already at 100% uh, solar, then like it's easy to add an additional solar power, uh, power plant, but it's kind of, it doesn't add a lot uh, unless you kind of have cheap storage or cheap transmission, super cheap uh, storage, super cheap transmission. Uh, so that's, that's what's called value deflation. So it's not really like, it doesn't really make sense to think about it as like one price point uh, that, that is being being undercut, right? So like we're in a situation where there are places in the world where like adding solar kind of happens without subsidies and it's kind of like essentially the natural result of like market forces or like mediated market forces. And we have also places with, with quite high renewable penetration, right? Places like California or Germany where like places that made renewables so cheap, but that are now kind of struggling to add a lot more because stuff like system integration or like the value of an additional um, plant is kind of um, that is kind of low. How much of our energy production could we be replaced by wind and solar alone? The, the problem with wind and solar, or one problem is that it's intermittent. So it, it requires uh, the sun to shine or the wind to blow, unless you have a really a good uh, storage technology, basically batteries. But how, how much of our energy production do you think we could replace by, by solar and wind? You don't only need batteries, right? So like, essentially, you need to solve I think three or four problems. So like one is kind of short-term storage. For this, you can use batteries. Uh, and right, that's, that's kind of like, okay, uh, you can run your washing machine during the night. That, that's kind of the use case. Then you kind of need to solve, in most places in the world, you need to solve seasonal storage, right? So that there's kind of like parts of the year where like there's much less solar available. And like, that's like a much, much harder challenge. And I think that's kind of underappreciated because people talk about storage, they think about batteries and they think the problem is solved. But like kind of essentially being able to have enough energy to like have a month or like more kind of worth of like energy reserve requires a very different um, solution. It's not probably not going to happen with batteries. That's kind of for something like, right, what I've talked about before, like uh, power to X, like producing hydrogen or kind of other forms of like um, low carbon um, energy, um, like gases or like non liquid to store energy. So like, that's kind of what you will need there. And then there's kind of the problem of transmission. And then there's the problem around essentially, do we have enough land um, in the jurisdictions? Um, I think the last one will not be the decisive constraint. I think that that will, will probably work. But essentially, there's like three, uh, three challenges, like storage in the short term, seasonal storage, transmission. I can't imagine a world, right? If when I think about the future, I always try to think of a distribution. And like there there's like part of that distribution where like, okay, wind and solar um are kind of really like 80 or 90 percent of the energy supply. And essentially seasonal storage uh, has been solved, transmission has been solved, and it's kind of that that's a large part of the solution. Uh, those are not the futures I'm particularly worried about because, I mean, those are really <laughs> very best case futures. It's like an AI safety of like AGI is inherently safe. That's kind of the, the future. Uh, and then there are kind of the futures where like something has gone wrong, right? And like that's kind of like in our climate response and like a natural thing or I think like a, one of the most likely failure modes right now that we can, like if we kind of, if we're kind of waking up in 2040 and like we're on a trajectory to like, more than three degrees, it's very likely that kind of we've been overbetting on intermittent renewables. That essentially that it is much harder, uh, even though it's easy to get to like 20, 30 percent in electricity, like getting to like 100 percent in energy, right? Again, like and then like growing demand, like something like 10x compared to now that this is kind of 
um, really hard. So this is an area where there's very significant uncertainty, I would say, where kind of, yeah, on the top, you can kind of do almost get almost 100%, but also where it's kind of quite imaginable that you don't get over over 50% of energy, which will still be like a huge, huge role, right? I mean, right now, it's kind of something like three to 4% of like energy. You mentioned uh, seasonal storage. What what are the most promising approaches there? Uh, this is something where it's not primarily about batteries, right? So where it's primarily about kind of uh, using more energy dense forms. So like, for example, yeah, using um, using kind of excess capacity, excess power capacity to produce carbon neutral hydrogen and to store this as hydrogen or to kind of store it as like synthetic natural gas. This to me seems right now the most plausible trajectory. I mean, there's also kind of, I guess there's, there's lots of different technologies that are, that are being tried out. Okay. So that's, that's solar and wind, which could turn out very, very well, but where there are uh, challenges to be solved before they can be implemented and can constitute a large percent of our, of our energy production. That sounds too pessimistic. It's more like solar and wind will definitely play a much larger role than they are playing now. The question is, will they take us to 100%? But like, um, yeah, that's a diff- yeah, it's a diff- different framing, right? So like, yeah, the short term story is definitely about the expansion of um, of mature renewables. We should say something about the, to my eyes, uh, insane decrease in, in, in the price of solar, <laughs> or at least it looks like a, a very, very uh, steep decrease when I look at these graphs. Yeah, can you say something about how much cheaper solar is now compared to 20 years ago? Well, it's essentially at like less than 10% of where it was 20 years ago, right? So like, that's, uh, that is an insane decrease. So I like, I remember when I was kind of entering the climate conversation and people were talking about renewables, they were always talking about solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, bio, at some point people only started talking about solar and wind, right? Because essentially those technologies got like radically cheaper in particular solar, wind also, but a bit less so. Yeah. So that's a very, very steep um decline right which has been achieved uh there's there's a great book about this how solar got cheap um by gregory namet but essentially it's kind of primarily a result of kind of very aggressive um policy i mean it kind of goes back to the 1970s and like the first oil crises and like jimmy carter but then kind of it really picked up in the early 2000s right of like germany kind of really strongly supporting it also like not only germany also like california etc and then like at some point, China essentially massively investing uh, in in production capacity. So yeah, and that's kind of um, a big part of the of the story as well. It's not a story of fundamental technological innovation. It's really more of a brute force um, <laughs> approach to making things cheap. What about hydro? Could hydro ever constitute a large percent of of our energy production? So hydro could, I think. I mean, it's like it's already. I think it's still, if I'm not mistaken, it's still like the largest um, renewable energy uh, resource, right? It's kind of, it's not really talked about because it's kind of like static. It's not like the, it's not sexy. It's not where the action is, but like it's a very significant um, part. I think like with hydro, like large hydro has like large kind of environmental downsides. And I think another kind of constraint, like so there's a couple of other constraints. I mean, one is like geopolitical. If you're kind of talking about dammed hydropower, it's often like a very kind of contentious issue if you're thinking about the Nile or other other areas. So like that's another big problem. And it's also like very long term infrastructure. So I think like hydro, I think like from a technical perspective, like hydro could play a larger role, but it's kind of I don't think there are many people that are kind of betting on like an abundant future with lots of hydro, um, or at least I haven't come across them. I think I know exactly like one charity that's working on hydropower. Um, uh, that's mostly on making a less clear path in the US and they're kind of trying mostly to use hydropower, making existing hydropower or existing dams more efficient, like essentially using them more to produce electricity. Do we even have enough large rivers to to generate enough electricity by hydro? That's a good question, but it's, I actually don't know the answer because it's kind of so far out of the Overton window. Um, <laughs> one, one other thing I want to say on hydro is that essentially hydro is affected by climate change as well, right? So like essentially that hydro is becoming a less reliable energy resource, essentially as kind of climate patterns, precipitation patterns become harder to predict and more extreme. So I think it's kind of another reason why it's not like it's not a major bet that anyone, I think, is kind of um, really making at this point. Okay, let's move on to nuclear energy. 
Um, what do you see as the advantages and disadvantages there? I mean, like the biggest advantage is like related to energy density, right? I mean, it sounds like ironic and very counterintuitive to say this, but like from an environmental perspective, like nuclear is kind of the cleanest, uh, cleanest form of energy production because it's like of those that we have right now, because it's so, so energy dense, it doesn't need a lot of materials, it doesn't need a lot of land. Yeah, so I think that's kind of the clear advantage, produces zero carbon. Disadvantages, I think, are, are well known um, in the case of nuclear. So uh, accident risk, nuclear waste, yeah, and also, I guess, some, some dual use concerns around like nuclear uh, weapons. Yeah, so I think those are kind of the, the disadvantages. And also, right now, but that's not a fundamental feature of the technology. That's kind of something of, I guess, it's a result of social choice. Uh, right now, it's very expensive and, and slow to build. Yeah, that was actually my, my next question would be, when I look at some new nuclear power plant, it has often taken a decade or more to build, and it's gone over budget. So, so why is it so... Why does it take so long and why does it cost so much to build nuclear power plants? Like I think right now, I mean, we were able to build nuclear power plants in France in something like four years, right? right? And right now, we're not able to do this in the West. Right now, it would probably more take something like 20 years. But so there, there's a lot of variance here that is like, it's not like related to the features of the technology or like our fundamental technological ability, right? There's like a 5x kind of difference that's kind of related to regulation, economy, societal commitment, et cetera, right? That's kind of where, where the explanation um, ultimately has to be. So I think there's kind of lots of different reasons. Um, I mean, one, like, I guess one most general one, which is not nuclear specific, is like in general in the West, we're not able to build things, right? It's not only that we're not able to build nuclear plants, we're also not in Berlin, we're not even able to build airports. Um, so, so I think that's kind of like the general class of like, there's lots of uh, general stuff around like regulation and kind of interest groups, but then there's also like nuclear, um, specific stuff. Right. And I think it's essentially, I think the most significant part is that essentially the, the supply chain, uh, for, for building nuclear in the West has essentially fallen, fallen apart. Right. So like we're building things kind of in a, in a first of a kind, um, style or kind of not first of a kind, but like first in a decade or first in a decade more which is not the way to build like anything kind of at scale, anything efficiently. That's not how France kind of built the nuclear fleet, right? So like the, the most su a successful example of building out nuclear quickly is like France from the like late seventies to like um, late eighties. So that's, I think most of the um, explanation. What did France do right? I mean, France was in a situation of emergency. So like the 1970s at the time of like the big oil price shocks and like France is a country um, without significant domestic energy supply. So they were extremely exposed to the oil price shocks. And at the same time, there were already a nuclear power, right? Like they kind of had like nuclear expertise, very centralized government. Um, so yeah, they essentially decided, okay, we're gonna build nuclear as like a national project and they kind of standardized it. Like one of a, like built the same kind of reactor, built in, uh, the workforce in a very centralized uh, fashion. If you kind of compare this to the US, for example, where like utilities are kind of like really spread out across the country and like, where like essentially there's like not someone who's buying like a hundred nuclear plants, right? There's kind of utilities that are buying like, um, one reactor or maybe two reactors and, and one plant or something like that right so like the the, the way that it's happens is like fundamentally fundamentally different so these were very special circumstances and like just to be very clear i'm not suggesting that those are transferable to today right like it's not that the kind of shock or stress that france was under it's not something we can replicate and say oh we're all we're all going to build like to 80 percent nuclear in like 15 years um because of climate change most countries are not able to do that like Technologically, they are, but like politically speaking, it's, it doesn't seem feasible. Do you think we we need to develop new designs for nuclear reactors? Do we need to 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 move to uh, yeah to better designs? Um, do we need a molten salt reactors or something like this, or are the reactor designs we have today enough? I mean, this is I think an active debate in the like in the nuclear community. And I think like, it kind of depends on how, how do we define need in this context, right? So like, I think like, from a purely technical perspective, right, there's nothing wrong with existing nuclear power plants. So 
what's wrong is kind of like when the fact that we're not able to build them is kind of lack of societal commitment and like lack of learning and stuff like that, right? So like we can't imagine a f future where we build a lot of that. So the question is, can, can we actually get into that future? The most significant benefit of kind of advanced nuclear and like small, small modular reactors is essentially, uh, it seems more plausible uh, that this is kind of like, like, or there, there are countries where it seems more plausible that we're going to build lots of, of small modular reactors because you can produce them in factories. You can uh, essentially exploit the same learning curve dynamics that made renewables and electric cars and all other kind of technologies that we were able to make cheap, cheap. So that's kind of uh, another aspect. And it's also kind of playing much better with a like renewable dominated grid. So it's kind of more flexible and it's also like a smaller, smaller unit. So I think there, yeah, I think, I mean, we are like philanthropically speaking, we are, we are betting on advanced nuclear or small modular reactors, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily related to like a technological problem with existing reactors. It's more like, yeah, the whole, yeah, I guess one of the themes here, it's not only about the technology, it's about the whole like societal kind of apparatus around the technology and so the the small modular reactors would be easier to innovate on because you would you would be able to develop one such reactor and deploy it and get feedback much much more quickly than you can with a with a larger reactor where it might take 15 years for it to to be built and only then can you go back and think about what you could have done differently is it also a question of potentially you can you can mass produce these small modular reactors? What are the advantages here? So like it is the mass production, right? The mass production in a factory. So it's not only the 15 year thing, right? Like under ideal circumstances, you could also build a large plant and something like four or six years. Like you could also learn something from large plants and you could build the same plant design uh, over and over again. But it's much easier to learn, and like obviously, it's like a controlled uh, production environment, right? So, like when kind of most of the production happens in a factory. I mean, obviously, some of the assembly has to happen on site, but like that is where you can really kind of expect a high learning rates, right? So that's kind of yeah, essentially applying the same mechanism by which we make make other kind of technologies cheap um, to the nuclear case. Uh, one last technology I want to run through is um, geothermal. This is something that's maybe like hydro, it's it's potentially a bit overlooked. Um, but yeah, well, how promising do you think geothermal energy is? So I would say much more promising than hydro, but I think also uh, geothermal is definitely having a moment right now and it's becoming radically less overlooked. There's traditional geothermal, which is kind of great, but it's very location specific, right? So you're low location dependent. You cannot do it, build it in lots of places because you kind of need essentially not, yeah, you need kind of good conditions. You need like, yeah, be close to a volcano, et cetera. So like, or you, essentially you need to be like close to, to, to a heat source near in the ground. And then there's kind of like different forms of like advanced geothermal. And that's a little bit like, there's like lots of different ones. It's like six or seven uh, different ones. But um, I guess the, the one that we've been focusing on traditionally is what you, what you would call ultra deep geothermal or like a super hot rock geothermal, where essentially you're going so deep that you can kind of make it uh, much less location dependent and also kind of get much, much um, warmer, what much hotter fuel. So you kind of get more, more energy density. So you get more favorable economics. And then that's, that's kind of the idea of like, geothermal um, anywhere. So if you're kind of able to drill like uh, five kilometers or five uh, down, yeah, that could be very promising. And that's kind of like in general, this is not only true for super hot or ultra deep, but also kind of more generally for like innovation in geothermal. What this does is kind of leveraging the advances of the fracking uh, of the shale gas revolution, right? So like our ability to drill uh, has been like strongly increased. Um, through the through the fracking revolution and essentially applying this to, to geothermal um, is kind of where a lot of the innovation is coming from. And it's kind of very attractive because once you make it work, right, you need to solve a couple of material um, science challenges here. But like once those are solved, you have like a very mature labor force and you kind of have like large economic interest in oil and gas that would be quite interested in that. So in that sense, it's kind of a, an innovation that is kind of locked in, if you will, right? So like it's kind of not locked out, like, 
Yeah, but if we're talking about drilling five kilometers down, this is not something you could do in, in, a, in a person's backyard. So this is not as uh, decentralized as, for example, setting up solar panels on a, on a roof in a residential neighborhood. No, it's solving the same problem that small modular reactors or like other kind of clean firm sources will solve, right? So it's not, this is not about everyone having a super hot rock thing in their backyard, but this is about solving the hard part um, of electricity decarbonization, which is kind of clean firm resources, right? So like not intermittent renewables, but something that can be dispatched and that can be used um, the entire time. I guess technically this is not a renewable form of energy, but in a in a kind of practical sense, it, it it will take billions of years for the Earth's heat to dissipate enough for for this technology not not to work. So in in practical terms, it's it's renewable. Yeah, in practical terms, I think the distinction renewable and not doesn't matter because um well I mean renewables also require lots of non renewables like resources to like like right like in a way so like the minerals that you need for like solar and wind and so like so yeah it's it's not a pra- it's not a practical thing to worry about. Um, but nor nor should you kind of worry about uranium running out or stuff like that. Okay, we've uh, we've done an overview of, of a lot of the technological options we have. If if you were to to rank these technologies and think about you know a plan for how we might solve uh, cl- climate change using a combination of, of them, where would you where do, where do you see most promise um, in in the short term and and in the long term? I mean, in the short term, it's very clear that like intermittent renewables uh, and natural gas will like do most of the like heavy lifting and decarbonization in the near future. So like, because they are quick to build and they're kind of quickly expanding, right? And like, okay, in some places also adding nuclear capacity and also in many other places, like not prematurely shutting down nuclear capacity, right? So like, yeah, so those are, I think, kind of the, the short term and then hydropower, uh, the short term options. In the, in the medium run, something like, well, like advances in geothermal or advances in small modular reactors, right, could kind of address what right now is kind of a little bit of the Achilles heel of kind of electricity decarbonization, which is kind of clean firm power, right? So like that's kind of why those are still important and like worth doing, even though like renewables right now are cheap and there's kind of this like seduction of like only relying on existing technologies, but like the reason to to not do that is like the risk that we talked about before, but also kind of the energy system function of like clean firm, which right now is kind of not adequately solved. And when you say clean firm, what do you mean? Well, so clean, right, means like zero emissions and like zero air pollution and like otherwise clean. So like that includes nuclear, that includes geothermal, that includes um, fusion, um, if it were, if it were to happen. And firm here means that it's essentially it is not an intermittent resource, right? It's kind of not like solar and wind that is kind of, so yeah, it can in principle be run 24 seven and you will not use it for electricity 24 seven, but you might use it for, for producing hydrogen at other times of the day. But like, yeah, essentially that you're reducing what storage kind of needs to do, right? Like it's, it becomes a lot like building an energy system that has like clean firm resources in it, like is a lot more realistic to get to like 100% kind of um, clean than if you're kind of entirely betting on intermittent um, resources. Yeah, so you think thinking across the different climate scenarios, it's a it would be a smart strategy for us to also invest uh, in some of these clean firm technologies and not just uh, traditional renewables like wind and solar. Okay, yeah. So I think it's kind of worth distinguishing two two separate strands of the argument here. Even on kind of a normal kind of trajectory where renewables are very successful, like clean firm is kind of a useful complement, right? And it makes the overall system more efficient. It kind of like re- reduces the load, like the necessity to like overbuild um, intermittent renewables, it reduces the necessity of storage, et cetera, right? So like the case for clean firm is not entirely like uh, hedging one. But then there's also kind of the, the hedging one, which is like, I think we talked about this before, right? Like. Um, if we kind of wake up in 2040 and like our situation looks much worse than we're thinking now, like what has gone wrong? Well, one of the main things that could, could have gone wrong is that like expanding solar and wind was much harder. And in that sense, investments in in clean firm are like a hedge against that. And yeah, there, there's a key fact 
of like climate that makes the hedging quality important. And that's essentially like the shape of climate damage. So that climate damage kind of like our, our expectation of like how climate damage looks like is that it's kind of like strongly nonlinear. So like a world with six degrees is like much worse than twice as bad than a world of three degrees and the world with three degrees much worse than twice as bad than 1.5 degrees. So it's kind of particularly important, right? I mean, you need to control for how likely those are, but like, it's like, even if you kind of control for, for how likely they are, it's kind of important to like favor solutions that work in situations where a lot of damage is. So those are kind of, right now I would say those are the worlds kind of north of like 2.5 degrees, like 2.5 to 3.5, like those are reasonably likely and reasonably more damaging than the worst cases so that I kind of t take a lot of the expected damage um, in, the, in the function. And under those, like if you're in those situations, right, you kind of, you know something, probabilistically speaking, you know, you know something that is likely to have happened in those worlds. And like one thing that is likely to have happened is that renewables will have like, um, yeah, been more curtailed than, than we expect. Okay. And, and I think we'll, we'll discuss this more later, thinking about different climate scenarios and where we should spend our, our money in, in, uh, to kind of cover all scenarios. But before we get there, I want to talk about some gov governmental options. What could governments do in order to, to help this situation? You mentioned before how uh, European governments and, and uh, California was able to subsidize uh, renewables to such an extent that they are now quite cheap. In general, what's your sense of, of how, how well subsidies work? Would you recommend that governments uh, try to pick out which, which t energy technologies they favor and then subsidize those? The broad answer to which this is kind of relates to like, what is, what, how good is the government at picking winners and like how, and how far should the government pick winners? I think like the broad answer is here, like the government was heavily involved in every kind of important technological success when it comes to energy and climate and were also like heavily involved in lots of different failures. Um, so like on the success, right, we have like solar, we have electric cars, we have wind, we have nuclear, we have fracking, uh, on the failure, we have stuff like Solyndra, we have stuff like, uh, biofuels in the U S which are like subsidized because they're kind of big in Iowa and Iowa is important for presidential elections. Like, so like you have like the good, the bad and the ugly kind of all, all together. Right. So like that, that's important, right? It's like, it's not. As, there's essentially no example of like energy technology transformation that kind of where government has not played a huge role. Um, so, so I think that that's something worth like worth remembering kind of to, to start. And it's also, there's no, because there's no clear example where essentially a technology has been an energy technology has been brought about primarily by market forces. Right. So like, um, so, so like there's demonstration projects, those are often public or like at least publicly, partially publicly funded. Then there's kind of, uh, well, there's basic R and D where like government also plays a big role demonstration projects. And there's kind of like early procurement policies, like across the entire chain of the um, environment uh, of the innovation process, government plays a huge role. And I think there isn't really an alternative to this, or like we haven't really observed an alternative to this. So I think the the view that I would kind of have is like in general, kind of government is much better than its reputation, because like once electric cars get cheap, then we're all celebrating Elon Musk, but we're like forgetting the fact that like there's like huge electric car subsidies that like made Tesla possible, right? Like, and I mean, there's a similar story, like not to pick on Elon Musk, right? There's a similar story for like most other kind of technological successes. At the end, there's kind of a private company that's kind of doing the last mile that's getting a lot of the attention. But like before, <laughs> or even at that last stage, there's huge, huge involvement by the government. So I think that's that's what I can say to to start. So government will make mistakes, but I think the alternative is not to not let the government um, pick. Ideally, and I think that's what we're kind of seeing in the United States right now, you're essentially are trying to support technology at the, at the right, at the right level. Right. So like you shouldn't choose all technologies and you should also like be humble in terms of like, you cannot pick, um, all the winners, but right now, if you look at the, the inflation reduction act and the infrastructure bills, like the two major pieces of kind of climate policy change in the United States are now, they're essentially like very broad bets on like lots of different technologies. 
And they're very kind of, on the one hand, like the in an infrastructure bill, like R&D driven, in the case of the Inflation Reduction Act, more like subsidy and later stage technology driven. Like, I guess they're a very strong form of government involvement, but in a way they're picking a lot of winners or like some of them will not be winners, right? So like they're, they're kind of very, very broad in their, their approach to their credit. And do and you think that's the right strategy to, to subsidize or to support uh, from the government side uh, across a wide range of technologies and across different stages of technological development? So if we're saying like history is informative, then I think that's kind of what history teaches us about like innovation and energy. Yes. Are there any research and development into one of the, the forms of, of energy technology we, we talked about that you think the government should spend more money on? Should the government be subsidizing at a later stage of development some of these technologies? So like, I guess to contextualize the moment that we're in, right? So like we're in, well, yeah, mid-20 or mid to late 2023. And like both in the United States and to a lesser degree also in Europe, like we've seen like major climate policies uh, over the last year, right? So like uh, like in the in the United States, let's focus on that case, right? So like the Inflation Reduction Act was passed like essentially almost exactly a year ago, a year before the infrastructure bill was passed. And like both of those are kind of like putting support for clean energy essentially on a on a whole order of magnitude kind of different level. So we're now subsidizing or the Inflation Reduction Act will kind of subsidize renewable, like not only renewables, clean energy and other kind of clean technologies on the order of like 300 billion at least and could go could go, uh, could go could go higher than this. We are in a situation where like money is not the primary uh, constraint right now for most um, kind of energy innovation, or it's kind of like it's it's much much harder to make that case, right? Like that doesn't mean we're in a situation where everything is kind of going great, right? It's more that kind of the, the challenge is maybe more like stuff like permitting reform or kind of making those demonstration projects happening, or like in the case of nuclear, reforming the nuclear regulatory. Commission. So it's not so much about um, money being the limiting constraint. Uh, that and like for the second part of the question, should they support at a later stage? Yes, absolutely. So I think the basic the basic problem in the discourse, I think, is that there's relatively broad support for like uh, basic research and development, right? Like uh, support for that is kind of very kind of mainstream, right? Like lots of conservatives will kind of support investment and basic basic r d because there's a very clear market failure there it's very well recognized so it's kind of very bipartisan or at least there's kind of like a broad kind of set of people that will support that but like the, the like the area where most failure happens is kind of in the later stages is kind of like getting the 100 million for a demonstration project so that's something that historically in the united states for example has been hard to kind of get political uh, buy-in to, to fund this work right because it's also like when you fail, you fail very visibly, right? So like Mitt Romney in 2012, like started his campaign at the Solyndra plant, right? Like the Solyndra being like kind of the example of the failure of kind of the, the clean energy investments of the Obama administration. So yeah. Maybe maybe explain what happened there. I'm not familiar with the, the is it called Solyndra? Yeah, so like Solyndra was kind of like an advanced solar company that kind of was kind of heavily supported by the American uh, Reinvestment Act, so kind of the... The small scale version of what Biden did now, like in large um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, kind of like so the recovery after 2018, the clean energy spending there. And Solyndra was kind of a very, very public failure uh, of, a, of a company that was kind of heavily uh, backed by the government. And yeah, essentially became the symbol of like, okay, the government is really bad at picking winners, right? And like that kind of happened at the same time as kind of the shale gas revolution was playing out, right? Where like also the government had kind of played a big big role um, in supporting that. So it's just like we're, we're very selective in like picking our um, examples. What do you think about carbon taxes? This is a solution to climate change that's often favored by economists, where you, you simply price the negative externality of emissions, and then you let the market figure out how to implement uh, or how to reduce uh, emissions. Do you, do you think carbon taxes could work? So, and I guess I've mentioned this in the beginning, but just, just to recap. So before I joined Founder Splash, I spent five years working on, on carbon pricing, emission trading system, carbon taxes. So I'm very familiar with those debates. I mean, I think they can work, but I think they will not play like a major role in kind of the solution. And just like to give a couple of 
couple of like arguments why. So if you're like thinking again about kind of the example of like solar and how solar got cheap. So the subsidies that kind of Germany was able to kind of, that were politically feasible in the early 2000s in Germany, you could have achieved them with a carbon tax between like 700 to 900, something in that range, dollars per ton. That's an insanely high carbon tax. So like at that point, most of the world had no carbon taxes at all, right? Like Germany had no carbon tax at all. Like the only kind of countries having carbon taxes were like Scandinavian countries. Um, and like even then, like the highest carbon tax would be something like fifty uh, dollars a ton, right? So like the really kind of transformative price signal that you need to like drive an immature technology, you will probably never get with a carbon tax that's politically feasible, right? Like you could not. You, it's not that you could have had a carbon tax at that level at that time. Um, so I think that's kind of one reason right and now we're essentially like now we're essentially in a situation where like solar where kind of the difference to the fossil fuel alternative is kind of zero in many cases right you wouldn't need a carbon tax essentially to solve climate change you need fundamental technological transformation and for that you need like very very strong push and you cannot get this kind of push with a with a politically feasible price um so that's kind of one constraint and the other constraint is kind of the international situation so if you were in a situation um, where you would have a global carbon tax right like maybe or a global kind of carbon price um, maybe that would be enough to kind of induce some some innovation etc but like you never like it's very far we're very far from getting there so i think right now we're in a situation where it's very clear that the most significant things that like individual countries can do, like in a situation where international coordination is relatively weak, are not about kind of in introducing a carbon tax. Like had Germany introduced the carbon tax in 2005, this would have, or sorry, in 2005, we got the emission trading system. So let's say if we had like introduced like reasonably high carbon prices early in the 2000s, would have kind of accelerated like transition from like German coal to Russian gas, that would have been the main effect would not have had like transformative effects uh globally speaking right so like that's i think the the really big um constraint there so essentially yeah carbon taxes might play a role once all technologies are reasonably close to competitiveness and then you can kind of iron out a little bit on the on the margin but i guess that that's kind of like not not the point where, where it really matters anymore yeah and just just to check with you what do you what do you think about planting trees is that uh, would, would that work at all is that on the kind of would, would that have a a large enough effect to matter um you sometimes hear claims about the importance of the of the amazon rainforest for example as a as a as a way of, of decreasing co2 in in the atmosphere could the government initiate uh, a large kind of uh, projects of, of planting more forests? Would that work? So, I mean, in principle, the easier thing had all, should always be avoiding deforestation because planting trees to like to have a carbon effect, right? Like it takes 20 years. It's not instantaneously useful. I mean, I guess to, for, I guess to start with, again, now we kind of need to refocus on, we're talking here on the margin. And when we talk about trees, Everyone loves trees. Like the person I meet the most, like the superficial kind of climate person I meet the most, right? Like the first, like they, they wanna, like they wanna plant trees. Like that's the first thing that essentially everyone kind of coming into this conversation jumps to. Yeah, this is exactly why I brought it up because I, I'm guessing that this proposal would be extremely popular with a kind of broad public, and and maybe that itself, even though planting trees may may not be the most effective thing. Just the fact that it's so popular might mean that it's it's easier to implement, and and that could be an argument for it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you would need to do a certain um, insane scale. But so if you if we're thinking about the kind of the existing solution in this space, which is essentially about like rainforest protection, right? And like there we have kind of an international carbon market um, around protecting rainforests. It's like called Red Plus, and the basic idea there is like you're rewarding countries for avoiding deforestation so and like the most 
significant example of this is like between Norway and Brazil, where like Norway kind of tried to like pay Brazil lots of money to kind of like, yeah, save kind of like um, deforest less. And the problem with that is I think fundamentally that you're rewarding something you can't observe, like you're, revo you're rewarding counterfactual, like you're rewarding avo additionally avoided deforestation, which is not something you can observe, right? So like you're, and so like that is kind of hard in the best case. And it's like essentially impossible when you have like sovereign nation states that all can kind of have their own, um, their, their own estimates. So that's one of the problems. And the other problem, of course, is kind of, it's not like, the main benefit of, of like avoiding deforestation comes from the long term again, right? So like, but you can't really have like credible, um, credible commitments over like decades in terms of protecting trees. So like, it's a solution that like looks seductively simple, but kind of in practice kind of doesn't work. Yeah. So like, that's kind of the case for avoiding deforestation and for planting trees. Yeah. I mean, you need to do those on a extremely massive scale and like it's not gonna have large effects kind of um in the in the short term yeah are there any other non-technological options that you like or that you find promising there's lots of other things we can do right so like i think one thing um that we should talk about briefly would be climate finance so which is essentially the idea of like incentivizing lower income countries for like building or like paying, essentially paying more clean energy um, infrastructure. Yeah, in principle, that's one of the things that you would expect if we had a global carbon market, right? Because like abating, abating emissions should be cheaper in a lower income country. Um, so that's another approach that kind of has suffered from many of the problems I've now talked about with regards to, with regards to, to rainforest protection. So that's another um, approach that I think we should mention. And then there's kind of when you're kind of in a situation where you have a lot of growth happening, right? So if you're kind of in emerging Asia right now, there is a lot of variance in like how emission intensive that, that growth can be. So like we've just hired um, a carbon lock-in specialist who will like, she will kind of look at what, what are the interventions we can do there. But like, if you kind of look at the literature, you can kind of see like clear differences related to, yeah, like how, how are cities being built and the, these kind of um, things like kind of shape, essentially shaping long run behavioral patterns by like different forms of, of infrastructure investments. Yeah. And you, and you mentioned uh, supporting innovation or innovation policy. I mean, that's kind of ties to what we've talked about before, right? Which is like the government is essential for technological transformation. What the government does can be affected by advocacy you can kind of fund through like where you can fund a charity to do this kind of work and it is it locks it kind of solves for this like what i des described as like the central conundrum of climate policy right that kind of essentially the us the eu have like way more leverage through innovation on like global emission outcomes than like through their territorial emissions so you have this potential for trajectory changing dynamics, right? That we've kind of been discussing with the, with the example of solar, electric cars, et cetera, that relatively small changes in the world, like in the, in the last, in the grand scheme of things, right? Like California aggressively supporting electric cars or Denmark aggressively supporting wind power. These are like small changes in the world, but like huge uh, long-term consequences. So I think that's kind of the thing. And like the other things that I, that I would mention uh, so like kind of on the, on the carbon, carbon lock-in side would be stuff like, yeah, essentially regulatory, um, reform, right. And the, in the U S this would be something like, um, permitting reform, which, which will become like a hot, uh, issue or is already becoming a hot issue because the, the financing for clean energy is there, but the permits and the regulation is not there. And there's similar, similar issues in like, um, emerging, emerging economies. Uh, so it's not all about, uh, technological innovation, not at all, right? It's also about like, um, yeah, shaping the regulatory uh, frameworks, et cetera. And here you're using some uh, amount of money in order to influence a much bigger amount of money. Basically, you're using philanthropic dollars to influence the dollars uh, or the, the money spent by governments. Yeah. So for everything that we're kind of funding, and there's always, there's always kind of advocacy in the broader sense of the term. So I'm kind of I'm saying essentially using philanthropy to influence much 
larger budgets, right? And like, like that reasoning comes from the fact that like, well, government budgets are like several orders of magnitude, like two to three orders of magnitudes larger um, than philanthropy. And also I think what we've already touched on, right? Like there's things that kind of essentially need the government, uh, even if it's like uh, changing regulation, et cetera, right? So like most impact focused philanthropy and climate is ultimately about kind of shaping actions of the government you know, or other large um, actors. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I do wonder though, are, aren't there a lot of kind of interest groups trying to get the government to spend money on, on various things? And so you might, there might be a lot of competition for influence over, over the, the government's resources. When I just talked about like the, the different sizes of the changes in the world, um, that kind of relates, um, relates to this. So I think that the best case or like the kind of the highest impact case for like um, philanthropy to have like a large impact on government policy is kind of in situations where there's like relatively little attention, right? So like if we're kind of thinking about the counter example of like the carbon tax, like needs national attention, needs like bipartisan support to be passed, definitely needs a national conversation. Like that's probably a situation where like an additional philanthropic dollar will not make a large difference because it's kind of like lots of other money is involved. Um, but when you're kind of in a situation where like, you know, okay, we're going to pass this big climate bill and like, there's a big national conversation about we, we want to do this big climate bill, but ultimately like how exactly does this climate bill look like, which technology does, does support and how that is kind of, I think the sweet spot for kind of, um, philanthropy, right? Because we're Essentially, there's like lots of political science literature for like how this kind of works. It's what's called le legislative subsidy. So there's kind of special well, charities that kind of specialize in like um, knowing which legislation would be needed to kind of um, promote a given technology or a given approach, and yeah, essentially providing providing that knowledge to to policymakers. So I think that's kind of a way in which in which charities can have a large influence and kind of policy fields that are less politicized and that are kind of like under, yeah, that are kind of not, not, not super, not super crowded. Yeah. Let's give an overview of the different climate scenarios. So what's most likely to happen with the climate and, and specifically, I think we should talk about the worst cases and, and, and how likely those are. If you kind of look at the forecast, there's something like a one third probability that we will kind of meet global climate targets. So that would be like limiting warming to, to two degrees. Then there's kind of about another third for something like between two, two and three degrees. And then there's kind of another third for everything kind of above three degrees from up to like uh, five degrees. So this is kind of from a, uh, we can, we can link this in the show notes, but like that's kind of from an, from an LSE paper that kind of tried to try to estimate those last year. And, but like, there's different ways to estimate this, but it's kind of like broadly, broadly consistent. So like, we're probably not on current trajectory is not going to meet the global climate targets. We're going to overshoot them, um, by a degree or so, um, at the same time, right. Kind of the really extreme scenarios, like six degrees or something like that has have become like very, very, uh, significantly less likely compared to what we believed like five or six years ago. Yeah, maybe you could describe some of the effects of the d these different degrees of heating. It's it's a bit abstract when when we're talking in terms of degrees. Could you describe some of the effects of of different degrees of heating? I mean, again, like this is of course an area where there's always like huge uncertainties, right? So like where like if you look at the bars, like when do certain phenomena start? It's kind of always like okay, this could start at two degrees, this could start at four point five degrees. Um, I mean, the thing that we're kind of like right now, we're kind of in a situation where we can, where we can essentially see climate change in our daily lives, right? Where like kind of the temperature extremes have clearly, um, changed also like where like many, not all, but like kind of many kind of natural disasters have a climate change signal on there. Right. So that kind of become more likely or more intense related to climate change. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, it's broadly kind of, I guess probably think these things have become more more intense than if you're kind of i guess if you're hitting two degrees or more then like tipping point uh tipping points become somewhat more likely so there are elements in the climate system that either would kind of have like local environment effects so like dieback in the amazon for example 
or kind of have like global climate effects, like uh, shifting global temperature up by half a degree or some, something of that sort. So those kind of things become, um, yeah, kind of become happening, happening more uh, as we're moving um, higher up. Yeah, I think that's kind of the main thing. So I would say this is pretty abstract. The reason for that is this is not really what I'm, I'm not really spending a lot of time on that. I'm mostly interested, like given what I'm doing day to day, I'm mostly interested in understanding the shape of the curve and how likely the different futures are because because that's kind of what's re most relevant for me to prioritize. And so are you prioritizing the worst case scenarios? No. Um, and I'm really happy that you asked this because this is a very typical misunderstanding. So what I'm essentially arguing for, um, and I have, I have a talk about this, which we can also link like on the, the structure of climate risk and its implications for high impact philanthropy. What I'm essentially ask, uh, arguing for is we treat this the same that we would treat other problems. So like we're essentially looking at um, expected damage, right? So like an expected damage is the product of two different things. It's like the probability of different futures and how bad those futures um, would be. And right now, most of the probability mass, so when we put these things together based on like current estimates, would be, and yeah, as I said, I think like above, like most of the damage would be above 2.5 to 3.5, but crucially it would not be in like six degrees or more, because that's like, even though those worlds will be extremely damaging, they've become so much less likely that they're, so that kind of the, the degree, like the low likelihood kind of dominates the strength of the signal. So it's not about just focusing on the worst worlds. It's kind of taking an, yeah, an expected damage. And, and the alternative to this that I'm criticizing is essentially much of the focus of the climate community where it's like black and white, like either we meet the goal of the Paris Agreement or we don't. Like there's all of this massive complexity that you talked about and we're just reducing it to, okay, on a two degree trajectory, we will need this and this and this. And like, that's kind of, I guess, in a way the, the wrong question. Where do you see the most expected damage then? Yeah, so, and the last time we ran these numbers and we should run them again this year, but like, uh, it's kind of, I think, in those worlds that are both reasonably likely and also much more like significantly more damaging than kind of the, the best case worlds, right? So they will be like worlds of like 2.5 to, to 3.5 degrees, uh, roughly. Uh, that's kind of where, where the bulk of the uh, damage is. So those are worlds where the Paris Agreement has not succeeded, right? Because I mean, the Paris Agreement's goal is to limit temperature to two degrees. Uh, there are also like worlds where like, yeah, some, some things must, must clearly have um, gone wrong. There are also not worlds like those worlds are not consistent with like super cheap renewables, easy, easy seasonal storage, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in those worlds, what are the most promising interventions to alleviate the, the, the expected damage? The method here is let's think about, because we're in a situation of extreme uncertainty about lots of different things, like how much our economy is going to grow, how carbon intensive is this growth going to be, how will different technologies play out, how strong will the climate react. And all of these things are highly uncertain, but we're trying to understand what do we know about the, the structure here? Like, what do we know? What is more likely to be true in a worse world, essentially? So like on the technological level, where we already talked about this, right? So like, okay, a typical, like there's kind of two, two typical or two, I think, failure modes that people would expect. Like one is kind of like renewables do not scale as much. Another would kind of be that um, electrification uh, doesn't scale as much, right? So that's kind of related. So if renewables don't scale as much, then like the clean firm uh, power sources that we talked about, right? Those are kind of, we're gonna play a relatively larger role. So like a significant part of the motivation of like investing in geothermal investing in advanced nuclear kind of comes, not all of it, but like comes from that. Um, there's of course also like other aspects to this, right? It's not only about the choice uh, of energy technology, it's also about like different kinds of solutions. So if you're kind of thinking about those futures, like those are not futures where, as I said, like international cooperation on climate, like being in a great shape is not consistent with being in a 3.5 world. So that means that things that kind of maybe look very good in the best case, right? Like if the best case is kind of like the case that we're in right now, or probably even better, let's say saving trees in the Amazon, like if we could kind of get this to work, right? 
like even if that were very cheap in the best case where we solve this regulatory problem that so far we were not able to solve now that's not going to work in this kind of world right so 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 that's i think something that's kind of contraindicated in this case right so it's kind of like this will look worse and similarly if you kind of think about the structure of the world economy like and kind of like the future predictions you probably have like more of the higher warming worlds are like um in situations where like emerging economies have been growing very strongly right so like um yeah we're making like let's say africa is kind of growing and growing very strongly. so it also tells us something about like regional uh, prioritization at some level i think actually that's a that's a great segue to where i would like to to um to end this conversation by, by talking about kind of interactions between climate and and other areas, if we could call them. What are the trade-offs uh, between economic development and emissions? Yeah, so that depends on where you are with regards to economic development. So there's a very strong relationship between economic development or human development more generally and use of energy. And that's like not like a one direction causation, right? So like we shouldn't say like more energy causes more development, but we should say that it would be very surprising that the world gets a lot richer without producing a lot more energy. So, so I think that's very clear. And like there, there's um, yeah papers on that that show this very clearly. And that's like kind of really, really strong kind of relationship. And the relationship is much, much stronger in the earlier part of the ladder, right? So like um, high income countries right now, are able to grow without growing their emissions, right? So there's like um, about 20, 25 countries or so that have been able to grow over the last decade, grow their GDP without growing their emissions. What would be kind of like the the, the weak kind of condition of decoupling, right? It's kind of not, uh, doesn't mean they will meet their climate goals, but it kind of means that kind of growth is kind of possible without increasing emissions. But that is not true on the, on the lower end, right? And like broadly for, for three reasons. If you're kind of very energy poor, then like, uh, so if you can kind of save more energy, like energy efficiency gains, et cetera, will just use like probably translate into, into more energy use. I think that's kind of one reason. There's two other ones. So one is kind of like earlier economic development is kind of more, more carbon intensive, right? So it requires stuff like, that requires a lot of steel and cement, the kind of stuff that's kind of um, hard to decarbonize right now, or which we actually have not decarbonized to this point at like um, reasonable cost. So that's kind of another um, aspect to this. Um, yeah, so that essentially you're doing lots of infrastructure investments that are that are very early, and of course also like the willingness to pay for climate policy is like um, very low, and rightly so, very low if you're in a in a very energy poor context, right? If you're in India and you have like 400 million people without access to electricity, then like the first thing that you're thinking about is not implementing a carbon tax. And so we mentioned one very large um, benefit of using less oil and coal, which is to de- uh, which is a, a decrease in air pollution. Do you think there are other additional benefits? Um, here I'm thinking in terms of uh, greater food stability or less conflict or um, something like that. I would call it the more sophisticated case about caring about climate change is probably less about like extreme weather events and the sh- like the direct impacts of extreme weather events, but more like political instability and conflict, especially in places that are heavily dependent on like, um, well, environmental conditions, right? Right. So if you're kind of in Sub-Saharan Africa and you have like rain fed agriculture, like that is probably the most likely case where you can get social destabilization because of climate change because you're like the vulnerability is very high so yeah i think that's kind of uh, an important effect this seems like very important from like like ethically speaking from a perspective of like okay this is hurt like climate change is hurting the global poor uh, the most and like it's kind of the most destabilizing um probably in those in those areas uh so i think that's a very important effect and something that I think effective altruists, it's easy for effective altruists to to forget that because in a way, if you kind of think about climate as a civilizational risk, I think I would agree that the the civilizational risk aspect of climate is kind of low because it's kind of hard to imagine a great power war because of climate change. And I guess like if you're kind of caring about the long-term future, like great power wars are just like extraordinarily important. 
but kind of from the from the more near term suffering perspective, like I think that's a very significant effect. Um, and another one that comes more from essentially making clean energy cheap, right? Is kind of so like reducing uh, energy poverty. So I just I just mentioned like I guess four hundred million people in India not having access to, to electricity, right? So like we're living in a world where like what we are thinking about first when we're reducing emissions, right? Like we can use, we can all use a lot less energy um, without like sacrificing a lot of our living standards, but we're not living in a globally representative part of the world, um, <laughs> both of us. And I think most listeners, um, so it's a kind of a very different situation. Like the average human on, on this planet is like very energy poor and like where the human development benefits of access to more energy are like very significant. Um, yeah. So, and ideally if it's quite clean and cheap energy, that's, that's the ideal, ideal case. Yeah. That's a great point. Johannes, uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Great to be here. <laughs>